I'll have to tell you that my wash machine blew up this week, just, just so you know. And I realized intuitively that's a kind of a replacement purchase you probably need to make right away. I, uh, I thought about bringing home a bag of quarters for my wife, but I, I thought, no, I, I got to go shopping. And uh, so I got home and we went shopping. And I haven't shopped for a, a washing machine in many, many years, so I had no idea how expensive they are now, by the way. Um, but we, uh, we were sold one, probably, yeah, probably the, not the one we probably needed. But we got, we got one home uh, after they delivered it, and, and it, had more, it had more buttons and, and bells and, and lights. Uh, it made me think of R2-D2, you know, and it made similar sounds. It was just, I, I was amazed. And when they finally delivered it, it was Friday, I came home from work, and I, I walked in to see this thing that, I, you know, depleted my savings account, and I said, well, I, this is amazing, Carlin. I, look at this. It's got turbo wash and speed wash and allergen wash and duvet wash and you know <laughs> cotton eco and f steam fresh and you know salad dressing on your shirt wash and just all these different things i'd never heard of before i was amazed at how many options they had and so i looked across at my wife and i looked at her and i was really serious i said you, you better sit down and you better read this entire instruction manual on this thing to which her head snapped back at me. And she didn't say it, but I could see it on her face. It was like, why don't you ever read the instruction manuals that come with your stuff? That's kind of the look on her face. To which I retorted with a similar look on my face. A lot of conversation without any words going on at this point. And I was like, well, you know, I like to figure things out as I go. You know, I just, men don't read the instruction manuals. I, I just, kind of how I, was responding, but, you know, there was just so many options, I thought, you've got to read about this. I mean, you just can't take, you know, chances on washing my shirts wrong. I don't know, I just thought, this is, this is too crazy. It made me think about the Sunday sermon, because by Friday I was well into it, and I'm getting ready for the message, and I thought that's how a lot of people live their lives, right? They, they just wing it. They just kind of figure it out as they go, like I like to do with stuff that I buy. Why, why consult the manual? We don't, don't need that. And I'm not just saying that. Literally, people like to wing it. I was reading this week a lengthy uh, Maricopa County uh, ethics survey. And basically, it had all these ways to look at the issues of how people make decisions about you know, what they value and what's right and what's wrong and ethics and morality and all that. And, and when it came down to it, one of the sections was on sources of authority. In other words, on what do you base your decisions for right and wrong? And, and at the top of the list, out of all the respondents in this extensive survey, the, the top answer was personal experience. In other words, based on just how I do it, and so I see what works, and I see what doesn't work, and I kind of figure it out as I go along, right? I thought, what an amazing thing that the, the, the decisions of life, not just whether or not I'm going to cheat on my taxes this year, but, I mean, the decisions about what I believe and what I value. I mean, ideas about where I came from and where I'm heading and what my purpose for being here is and, and the things I should prioritize. When it comes down to it, most people are just figuring this out as they go and trying things. And if they work and some subjective impulse makes them feel like that was a good decision, well, then they make more of those decisions. It's just amazing kind of the arbitrary subjective nature of people's decisions about big issues in their lives. I mean, life is full of options. And you can make all kinds of decisions about how you're going to invest your life, what you're going to believe, and it's all based on information. And the question really is where you're, where are you going to get that information? You know, and you say, well, those probably people don't believe in God. I read another uh, survey this week. It was a Gallup, published Gallup poll. And in this particular poll, they're asking all these questions about things, and 95% and of the respondents said they believe in God. And then all the things that were said for all these people that believe in God, and some of them didn't surprise me because I know people's definitions of God are pretty broad, but in one of the questions was about reincarnation. Do you believe that when you die, you come back to earth and, you know, the cycle goes on? Basic Eastern, you know, religious reincarnation. And 33 of the, 33 of the respondents, right, one-third said, we believe in reincarnation. That okay, you believe in God, but who knows what kind of God. Well, then they asked, one of the questions was, do you go to church? And out of the respondents that said they went to church, not occasionally, not seldomly, and not monthly, but weekly, think about that. They said, I go to church weekly. 
You would think the question of reincarnation now would, would die from 33% to maybe, I don't know, 3%, people that are sleeping during church, right? But it wasn't that at all. Do you know what that dropped to? Only 25%. Think about that. People that say they sit in churches, Christian churches, listening to Christian sermons from the Bible. They leave with, with an idea about their future that, that God said nothing about. Matter of fact, he's very clear about what happens to you after you die. And there's no, no mention of reincarnation. And what does that prove to me? That even people that claim to go to church and believe in God and they say that the Bible is, is a source of authority in their life, it's really not the, the primary source for a lot of people. They're able to believe things that are in, in stark contrast to the teaching of the Bible. Why is that? Because like a lot of people in this world, they kind of filter all the things that they hear and kind of mix it all together and come out with something that's based on what fits their experience or their preferences or their ideas or their feelings about things. Life is filled with choices, decisions, things that you're going to have to kind of base on something, some kind of information. Where do you get that information? We're in our study of Luke, we've gotten to uh, the beginning of a very lengthy, at least for our pace through Luke, a very lengthy sermon from Christ. Uh, sometimes equated with the Sermon on the Mount, and perhaps it may be a cliff note version of that, uh, perhaps, and I'm inclined to believe that it's a separate preaching event with a lot of the same themes. Uh, we'll call it the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, he's uh, sit seating, sit sitting, rather, I'll get that word out, he's sitting on a mount, uh, and, and here he's described, as we'll see, as standing on the plain. But whether it's the same sermon or not, the bottom line is he's teaching about all varieties of things with a kind of authority that everybody stands back and says, wow, he speaks with authority, and he holds it out, not as opinion or as random thoughts about good ideas. He's not Dr. Phil here. He's giving you authoritative instructions. I've entitled this sermon, the subtitle, uh, Learning from the Lord of Life, because that's the way he sets himself up. Matter of fact, what we'll see here, and all we'll be able to do is set the stage for this in verses 17 through 19 in Luke chapter 6, is just see how the stage is set for the sermon. We'll spend the next 11 sessions in our study of Luke just unraveling every topic. And as you look through the topics, if you've opened your Bible already to Luke 6, you'll see he covers all kinds of things. Don't just rely on the headings, because there's a real staccato and quick pattern through this text of all kinds of ideas that relate to you know, what we consider true wealth. You know, how we should view money, how we respond to pain, how to pursue satisfaction, how to navigate disappointment, what real joy is about, what things are worth sacrificing for, how to handle conflicts, what love is, what love isn't, you know, our ideas of justice and injustice, who to follow, who not to follow. I mean, the list goes on and on, things that you and I deal with every day. Now, last week, just by the way of getting some context as we were studying through the last section of that picking of the uh, 12 apostles, we, we started with just some orientating concepts, like Jesus came to earth with a mission, and his mission was, in his words, to give his life a ransom for many. And then we said he also came with a message, and we kind of uh, codified that and crystallized it with the words repentance and faith. I mean, that's how he starts preaching. Certainly in, in Mark chapter 1, those are the first recorded preaching words of Christ, that they needed to repent of their sins, and they needed to trust in the good news of the gospel. And I mean, that, I suppose, typifies the message of salvation. If the death of Christ, the ransom of Christ is going to apply to you, then you need to repent and put your trust in Christ. But that's not all he went around saying. As this quick survey through the Sermon on the Mount it tells us, it reveals, he's talking about all kinds of things. Things that relate to more than just how do you get ready to die. I mean, here's instructions on how you're supposed to live. And as we'll see here, and let's read it real quickly, verses 17 through 19, the things that he does reminds us that he is the authority over all life. He is the manufacturer of life. He's the guy who can repair life. He is the one giving us instructions from the manufacturer. Here are the rules. Not just another voice, not an opinion, but the words of Christ. Let's start in verse 17 just to set the setting. And as I said, we won't even get to the red letters today. We're just going to set the scene, verse 17, when it says he comes down. He came down the mountain. He, Christ, with them. That's the uh, 12 apostles. He stood on a level place. Now, there was a great crowd of disciples. That's not the 12 now. That's the others. 
from whom he picked the 12 disciples, and a great multitude of people, not just the people that have been following him around Galilee, but a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem. Now, catch the geography of this, as we've had to note throughout the study of Luke. He's up now in a Galilean ministry up north where the Sea of Galilee is, around these cities that surrounded the lake in or near Capernaum, where a lot of the action has taken place in Luke so far. And then Jerusalem is way down south. I mean, a suburb of Jerusalem is Bethlehem, where he was born. And that whole area is called Judea. And as we've noted many times, that's about a three-day walking journey, if you're, help, if you're healthy, to get to Galilee. That takes time. It's like driving to Chicago. I mean, at, at, even a, at an aggressive clip, it's going to take you a few days to get there. So people have come a long way. Not only that, it says, and also from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now, of course, if you think about the map in the back of your Bible or you know the geography, the Mediterranean Sea is off to the east, I'm sorry, to the west, and northwest of where Galilee is, is are the cities, the ancient cities of Tyre and Sidon. Those are, uh, you know, the, the, what's now modern-day Lebanon, not far from Beirut. And here we have people coming at least a two-day journey from there to hear Christ, not only from from these places that we're familiar with in Judea and, and Jerusalem, but from all over the place. And they came to do what? Verse 18, two things. To hear him, right? They'd heard about his teaching and his message. They wanted to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits, there's a bit of a distinction from some disease you might have. They were cured, using a medical term to talk about the fixing of their problem. And all the crowd, verse 19, sought to touch him, for power came out of him and healed them all. Now, this is an interesting medium by which he heals these people, but that's what we've got. You say, well, that sounds more like a healing service than a teaching service. But look, verses 20 and following, that's all we get is red letters and he's teaching. And he's not talking about health and he's not talking about your diseases. He's talking about how to live your everyday life. So even before we get to our outline, even before we look more closely at verse 17, I just want to talk about that connection between healing and teaching, which we've already noted, but I want to go back to it. If you've got your Bible open to Luke 6, turn back two chapters to Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, we can make a few observations about when this conflict, if you will, in Christ's time, in his calendar, came to a place where he had to make some decisions. He could spend all of his time healing people. But he had to make decisions, and he gives us a sense of his priority here in what he says. Drop all the way down just to that paragraph there that begins in verse 38. You can see above, if you have an ESV, the heading reads something uh, along the lines of Jesus healing many people. Do you see that? Jesus heals many. Well, if you look through that, in Capernaum there, he's having a bunch of the events take place there as he's having here in Luke 6. People are being healed of their, their ailments. But then in verse 42, he leaves. It says, in that day, this is Luke 4, 42, when it was day, rather, he departed, and he went into a desolate place. And the people sought him, and they came to him, and they would have kept him from leaving them, and they tried to. Now, think about it. You, you get your healing people in town. I mean, there's a lot of sick people that can come from all over the place. I mean, we've got more sick people here for you to heal, Christ. But, contrasting conjunction, instead of staying and healing all those people, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. Now, if it's all about healing for him, he would have said, I got people in other towns. I got to go take my healing service to another place. Not what he says. I got more to preach. Then he makes it crystal clear, bottom of verse 43, for I was sent for this purpose. What's your purpose? Healing campaigns? Healing services? No, no, no. My purpose was to teach. What's the combination between teaching and healing? We often see the healing somehow in the setting associated with the teaching as we do in chapter 6. All this teaching preceded by healing. Maybe you can think of it this way, back to the broken wash machine. Maybe it's your wash machine and not mine that gets broken this week. And for some reason, we pass, uh, you know, in, in the store, in the hallway, or you happen to be at church, and you tell me, hey, you know what, my wash machine blew up today. And I say, oh, before you go buy a new one, don't do that. Let me come over. I'm going to fix it. So I bring my little satchel of tools, and I walk into your laundry room or your garage or wherever your wash machine is, and you go, well, I've already had the repairman out, and he said, you can't fix it. I'm going to have to get a new one. Oh, no, no, no. I spend like six minutes, right? I pull the back off of it. Doo, 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 doo. You don't even know what I'm doing back there, and I shut it up and say, good as new. You go, well, you're kidding me. Test all the buttons. Working. Great. Wash away. Have, have, have fun, right? 
well, use your washing machine. And somebody's looking through maybe the open garage and says, wow, that's amazing. You know what? My washing machine's on the fritz too. Can you take a look at mine? Absolutely no problem. So I go, I start making the rounds in your neighborhood. Everybody on your cul-de-sac, I fix everybody's washing machine like, like that. And you're just, your jaw's on the, you know, Mike's missed his calling. He should have been a, a you know, appliance repairman. This is amazing. He fixes it so quickly and so great. And it's just like new. Every, every machine he touches is like new. Okay? Let's say I've done that for like 10 people in your neighborhood. And then I say, hey, all the families in the neighborhood, matter of fact, I want to call everybody together. I want to talk to you about how to use your washing machine. Would you listen to me if I had a little lecture to give on how to use your washing machine? I bet you would. Why? Because you just watched me within, you know, six minutes fix every washing machine that I touch. This guy's got to know something about washing machines. Do you see the parallel yet? Jesus starts the teaching ministry here by physically fixing broken lives. Physically, right? You've got people that are paralyzed or who knows what their problem is. Skin diseases, leprosy. He touches these people and instantaneously heals them. And this is now. Let me talk to you about living life. And he's going to talk about everything from how to deal with problems to how to love, what integrity is about, justice, injustice. And he's going to talk about all these issues of life. You going to listen to him? Absolutely. Why? Because he's establishing himself as the Lord of life. He's the manufacturer. We should listen to him. I'm not just speculating, by the way. These are the cues I take from the Scripture. And if you're taking notes, you should jot these references down. Let me just give you two real quick. John chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. John chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. Jesus ties the miraculous events that he's doing to why people should listen to him. Here's what he says. He says, if I'm not doing the works of my Father... See, and the thing about God is he's above natural. He's supernatural. He can do supernatural things. He can speak things into existence. He says, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do do them, even though you don't believe me, you're struggling with what I'm telling you, man, at least believe the works. Can you look at it and see what I'm doing? Then you will know and you will understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. I carry heaven's authority. Listen to me. What's the point? He connects his ability to do the works of the Father with the fact that they ought to be listening to him as though the Father is speaking because he is God. And that should arrest our attention and make us say, wow, you want to tell us how to use the washroom? Oh, I'm going to take notes. Because you obviously prove who you are, the Lord of life. By extension, Jesus promised in the upper room discourse, by the way, that the apostles would be chosen to codify and extend his teaching and fill in, if you will, the rest of the new covenant instruction. And here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. That'd be worth jotting down. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And again, it's about the message. Listen carefully to this. He says, you must pay closer attention to what we've heard. This is about the message. Lest we drift away from it. Don't think it's, you know, just an opinion here. Then he says, if the Old Testament message by the law that was declared by angels proved reliable, I mean, if that we knew was God's word, and every transgression and disobedience received a just retribution, and God was dinging people for not doing it, how are we going to escape if we neglect such a great salvation as it was first declared by the Lord, and then attested to us by those who heard, those are the apostles, while God bore witness through these people by signs, wonders, and miraculous gifts of the Spirit. Now think about that. The ability of these apostles, just like the ability of Christ to very rarely, by the way, in biblical history, break natural law, it was always prelude to the revelatory information God would give, which is supposed to be the foundation for the decisions we make in life. Whether it's back with Moses and Joshua, those miracles there that established the early Old Testament, whether it was the miracles of Elijah and Elisha that established the school of the prophets, and then we have the codification of the rest of the Old Testament, or whether it's the coming of Christ and the apostles, those three rashes of miraculous gifts provided the attestation, as this text says. It attested to us. It gave the credentials that when God speaks, it's not just random thoughts. It's not just opinion. It's not to be taken as part of the soup that we build to decide what we're going to do. We better listen to this voice above all the others. It is the thing that should determine, as a body of information, what we do and what we don't and how we live. Now, of course, Jesus came to tell us how to get right with God. But 2 Peter 1 says, the information that comes along with that is the guide for our lives. We have to add to our faith. And then he starts talking about all these virtues that come from the teaching of Christ and the apostles. 
To put it in the words of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and I always say these things because some people think, well, you know what? Everything Christ said, it was only about you getting right with God. It was about a lot more than that. I mean, here's how it's put in 2 Timothy 3, 16. You know the passage about the God-breathed words? It talks about the fact that all of that that was given by God, all of those things were good for teaching, rebuking, or, or reproof, and correction, and training in righteousness so that the man of God can be complete, right? have all the equipment he needs to do good works, right? Be ready for every good work. God wants you to live a godly life that reflects more and more of the character of his son. The teaching that we're gonna find in the Sermon on the Mount is not just so that you can learn how to get saved, although there's information about that. It's about how you and I can live in everyday life, and it's not just opinion. We need to be different from the world. As a matter of fact, let's put it this way, as we take this prelude to, this, to the message or the sermon, if you will, on the plane, let's take the prelude to this as a paradigm for us as we deal with the body of information that was left behind, the Word of God. Let's see, okay, how do these people come to Christ? Let's, let's at least parallel that for us and, and, and do what I think is really fundamental for us in a world full of opinions and voices. Number one on your outline, let's be careful where we go for truth. Let's make sure that much like the people of the first century who came to hear him, and not only to hear him, but to get healed by him, let's make sure we recognize we can't sit on the coast of Tyre or Sidon or somewhere down in Judea and say, well, that's good information, and you know, I'm sure it's good for some people, and why don't you tell it, a, you know, tell it to me a second. These people, they, they worked hard to get there, to be in the presence of Christ, to hear what he said, and to have the benefits of what he was providing in giving the credentials for his deity. It says in verse 17, he came down with them, stood on a level place, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, great crowd of disciples along with them, a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. If you had a sick uncle and you were somewhere down in Judea and you knew the healer was in, in Galilee, I mean, you better pack up the mule and you better get him there because you're not, there's, at least in this case, no long distance healing. You had to be there and in this case we learned you even have to touch him. That's how people were getting healed. You have to go and seek him out. And here's the thing about us. We have within the leather covers of your Bible, the information of God, God's word in print. And you'd better go there to get information because here's our temptation to get information about the decision-making of our life from a lot of sources. Let me give you a few options here. If you're building some subpoints to this, careful where you go for truth. Here's some places we're tempted to go and we shouldn't. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to get the first one. And I know you can broadly describe this as the world or whatever, but once you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, jot this down. I think this is the way we view it, and certainly it was viewed this way in Corinth. Sometimes we're tempted to get the authoritative information from, let's call it this, the cultural elite, right? I mean, the, the smarty pants in society, the PhDs, the seminary profs, the guys who write the scripts for the Discovery Channel or the History Channel, those guys know and you know what, if they say something's true and the Bible says something else is true and they're in conflict, well, I don't know, maybe we can mix it into a soup and use that as the basis for our understanding about where we came from, where we're going, what we're here for, I don't know. Or maybe, hey, we'd be foolish if we were out of step with those people. Maybe we should just believe them and see the Bible and some of its information, at least part of it, is some vestige of some you know, superstitious age and it's certainly not us. We're, we live in the 21st century. We gotta listen to the smart people of our day. Bottom of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 20, God challenges that kind of temptation and certainly that practice. And he says, listen, guys, where is the one who is wise? Come on, pull forward your PhDs and your smartest guys in society. Where's the scribe, you know, the seminary professor? Where's the guys who have all the, you know, the clout? Where's the debater of this age? Who's the one who can win every argument in the debates? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? What do you mean by that? Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through, through wisdom, right? Whatever it thought was the smart thing and all about, they didn't get to know God that way. There was no reconciliation with God. No, it pleased God through the folly, the simplicity of what we preach to save those who believe. You want to get right with your creator. You want to deal with the guilt. You want to make sure that you're ready to meet your maker when you die. All the lectures, all the journals, all the debating never accomplished that. And God said, look at that. Now look at what we provided. Look at what God sent through the apostles and prophets. There's the message of truth, and you know that. Experimentally, you know that. And he says, think about the difference between these two. Which one solved the big problems of life? 
He says in verse 22, people are going to want a lot of things, and you can get wrapped up into that. The Jews want a sign. The Greeks want wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. I mean, that's the apex of history, a stumbling block to the Jews. They can't handle it, and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, those of us that get saved, whether we're Jews or Greeks, Christ becomes the power of God and the wisdom of God, and we see that. Verse 25, for the foolishness of God. You may see it as, you know, something silly and simple. It's wiser than man. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. I know we feel out of step when we're mocked and ridiculed because our view isn't the view of the cultural elite of our day. But you know what? Here's the thing. When it comes down to it, God's saying, why don't you compare those two? In reality, what does the wisdom of God result in and what does the wisdom of man result in? When it comes down to it, by the way, when everyone mocks me for not being in step with the greatest, you know, latest ideas coming from academia, I always ask them, do you want me to believe this generation's academics or do you want me to believe the next generation's academics, right? All their views continually morph and change. Have you noticed that? God has spoken some things that while you may think they're antiquated or some vestige of some puritanical age, when it comes down to it, it doesn't change. Not only has it been tested by human experience, but it has, has had the imprimatur of God's revelation. In other words, things like predictive prophecy, things like a resurrected and empty tomb. You've got things that make me stand on the body of information, some of it that we're going to get in this series for the next 12 weeks. And we're going to recognize if God said that's true, even if the cultural, cultural elite want to mock it, you know what, I've got a decision to make. What body of information am I going to use for my values, my ethics, my decisions, the directions and purpose of my life? Here's another one. If you're building a sub, uh, set of sub points here, jot this one down, letter B. How about your own intuition? That's a popular one. It's a little different than experience. This is not what's worked in the past for me. It's what the present feeling of my heart is. A lot of people think, you know, I'm going to make my decisions not on what the Bible says. I may give it some lip service, but when it comes down to it, if it feels right to me, then I'm going to do it. Jot this down if you're taking notes. Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. It's the heart of the turning point for Eve and her temptation. When Eve is tempted, Satan employs, at least from our human experience, the oldest strategy in the book. He gets Eve to make the decision that what God has said needs to be set aside because of what you feel. And right now, you feel this. It says she got to the place where she saw that the tree was good for food. That's her feeling and assessment. That it was a delight to the eyes. That made her happy. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. <laughs> well, not in the way she thought. All of those things were based on her impressions, her feelings, her intuition. And she said, God said one thing, but I feel another thing. I'm going to go with what I feel. The sermon on the plane that we're going to study is going to present some things that may great against how you feel. It may not be conventional wisdom in your heart, but you need to make a decision. Am I going to make decisions in my marriage, my life, my business based on what I feel is right or based on some of the principles that God has clearly laid out in his word that he says are his truth, the manufacturer's instructions? Got a decision to make. How about this one? It's real popular today. Let her see the polls. Let's call it the polls. Consensus. What everyone thinks. Now, sometimes the academia is not even at the place where consensus is in our society. And we see the folly of this already, don't we? Things that right now are condemned as silly if you believe the old antiquated opinion of things, whether it's our sexual ethics or whatever, is something that the very people that condemn us said just the opposite, I don't know, seven, eight, ten years ago. And the reason, they say, is because we're past the tipping point now. Everyone in society sees this. Well, maybe not everybody, but most of us. And now that we're in the majority, if you don't agree with us about this and how we should act or what's right and what's wrong, then, oh, you're wrong, you're foolish. Think that through. When the polls determine what's right and wrong and not what God has said, what's right and wrong. We're sure not only to have an ever-changing ethic in our life, but we're going to get to the place where we recognize there's no foundation. There's no benchmark. There's no measure of right and wrong. Really? Jot this one down if you would. 1 Samuel chapter 8, good example of it, verses 4 and 5. It's the heart of the debate about whether or not Israel should have a king. They wanted a king. Do you remember why? Sunday school graduates? Everybody else has got one. God set up a theocracy. They wanted a monarchy. Why did they want a monarchy? Because all the other nations of the ancient Near East, they were monarchies. I want a monarch. I want a king. 
God said, no, 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 no. And eventually, do you remember what Samuel says? He's so bummed out about this, the inference is he feels like they've rejected him as a prophet. And God has to say, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Think about that. God, your way and what you want. They wanted to set it aside because no one else did it that way. If you're all about fitting in, see, then this next set of sermons is not for you. Because a lot of the things are so ancient, if you will, they're revolutionary because they're in the minority. But the question's going to be, what will you base your decisions on? What will you found your, 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 your values on? How are you going to live your life? Are you going to live it based on the polls? God says that's a bad decision. Speaking of experience, the Maricopa Ethics Study said, hey, that's the number one most common way, at least in that ethics survey, as to how people decide whether they should do something, whether they should value something, whether something is right or wrong. Their own experience. That's pretty common, especially for Christians. It creeps into the church. Because people say, well, the Bible says one thing, but here's what I've determined. If you look at things that are different than what the Bible says, if you look at something that's in conflict with what the Bible says, and you see how that works, it really works out better. As a matter of fact, when we do it this way, I know it's not the Bible's way, I even see it be, quote-unquote, blessed by God. It looks like it. They're very pragmatic about their decisions on right and wrong. Turn to this passage, if you would, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me explain this to you in a way that is reminiscent of, of a passage I quote a lot, and that's um, over there in Psalm 50. When the people did things that were contrary to what God had revealed, and they were not immediately judged by God, to put it in the words of God, you transgressed my law, I kept silent, and then they made this assumption. You thought, God says, that I was like you. You thought I agreed with you. You thought my rules were your rules simply because when you ditched my rules, I didn't immediately zap you with a divine bug light. So you made wrong assumptions about right and wrong simply because I didn't immediately respond. Or to put it in the perspective of the person, you know what, I tried something, it seemed to go fine, God didn't seem to be mad, my life wasn't cursed, it seemed to be blessed, my experience says I should do things this way. And you have a lot of quote-unquote Christian friends telling you that about a lot of stuff that they don't like in the Bible. Because their experience seems to stand in conflict with what God says. 2 Peter 3 is another example of that. Look at how it's put, starting in verse 2. Peter calls them back to the word, to the truth, to the data that God has revealed. You should remember, he says, verse 2, the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. What? I should go back to what they said. Yes, God has revealed his truth. Knowing, first of all, you're going to run into conflict here. Scoffers are going to come in the last days with their scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Okay, they've got people who say you're stupid to believe that. And then they're going to bring in their evidence. And here's their evidence. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. That's empirical, man. There's some empirical evidence right there. You say God's coming back to judge a sinful world. People are living pretty sinfully and nothing's happening. They seem to be doing just fine. You think God's all uptight. Can't you just relax? God's fine with it. God loves everybody. Everybody's cool. God's just approving of all this. Do you want to be open-minded and liberal like the rest of us in thinking through these passages of Scripture? And don't be so hard line on it. God's not judging anybody. The whole point of this passage is don't let the empirical evidence of your experience allow you to believe that what God said isn't true. If God says something is wrong, it's wrong. If God says you shouldn't base your decisions on this thing, then don't base your decisions on that thing. If God says this is the definition of integrity, you believe it, even if your experience tells you different, because there will always be a day of reckoning. God will always call us back, and as the Bible so poetically puts it, he will open the books. And one of those books is going to be the instruction manual that he gave us for life, and you're going to go, well, uh, you know, my experience told me different. One more, A, B, C, D, E, if you drop down to verse 15, if you're still in 2 Peter chapter 3, this one I suppose is most insidious, particularly within the walls of the church, the discussions you have in your small groups, it says, count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote you according to the wisdom given him. Okay, so God apparently is imparting divine wisdom to Paul to write these things down. 
as he does in all of his letters, verse 16, when he speaks of these matters regarding the coming judgment, the end of time. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable, look at this word, twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Sidebar here, he's equating Paul's letters on par with Old Testament scripture. But the point is, whatever the written prophets say or the apostles say, some people take them and twist them. He calls them ignorant and unstable. Therefore, he says, verse 17, beloved, knowing this beforehand, that there are going to be people with a Bible in their hand telling you stuff that's not biblical, take care that you're not carried away by the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But instead, keep going back to the word, verse 18, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're going to look at the words of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the Sermon on the Plain, and there will be people with a Bible in their hand. A lot of them are the reductionists of our day who take one theological point and then try to get you to overlook all that the Bible teaches in other places. But what we need to do is look at everything that we encounter in this sermon and say, you know what, I don't care if they're Bible quoting. If they do not take the fullness of what God says, in this case, regarding what it means to live a holy life, then we need to disregard them. Because the Bible says, I will lose my stable position, which is where we're going to go in this message. As a matter of fact, that's the conclusion of the message. And that is, if you disregard these things and don't put them into practice, there's a price to pay. So don't let someone, whether it's the cultural elite, your own intuition, the polls, your own experience, or someone coming in with scripture twisting, get you to look at something that's clear and plain in the Bible and dismiss it as a foundation for your decision making. Friday night after a crazy day of having our wash machine installed and I come home from work and mess with the buttons and have that conversation about instruction manuals, we realized our kids got taken in different directions and so we went out to dinner. Because it was Friday and we didn't plan to and someone had given me a nice gift card to a really nice restaurant, so we go to this restaurant, but of course we didn't have reservations, which means you're going to get stuck in the worst table in the whole restaurant. That's exactly what happened to us. So, nice meal, wrong table, and when they put you at a bad table, it's like the noisiest table in the place. And then I had Mr. Loud right behind me, right, who's just having a full-blown conversation, very colorful language, by the way, about all kinds of things that have happened in his life this week. And, of course, my wife and I are trying to have a conversation, mostly about the washing machine. But there we are talking, <laughs> and she's talking to me, and literally every voice around our table seemed louder than my wife's. And I realized the challenge that we have. It's much like the challenge that I'm trying to present to you. The cacophony of noises in our culture, trying to vie for your attention to say this is what you should believe. Here is the thing that you should base your decisions and your values and, and your ethics on. All of that. We've got we to zero in and listen to the one conversation that matters. And the one conversation that matters is when the Lord of life speaks, whether it's through his recorded sermon in these red letters, or whether it's through the extension and the fullness of the new covenant information given through his apostles, pay attention to what he says. All kinds of conversations that you can hear if you tune into them, but you've got to tune into the one that matters, because the one that matters is the one by which you will be evaluated one day. It matters. It's like I think of the moms up here, the new moms with their new babies, and I remember this is a new dad. Your wife instantly gets this hearing upgrade when she has a baby. Have you noticed that? I mean, the TV can be on, there can be a siren outside, there can be noise everywhere and, and pots and pans clanging. And if the baby whimpers down the hallway, right, she's hearing things that I don't think actually made any noise. And off she goes. It's like that supernatural being attuned to the voice of God. And you don't find it in your intuition sitting on a rock. See, so you get it by going to the Word of God back, as they say in Isaiah, to the law and to the testimony. Get back to the scriptures as it's put in our passage here that we just read in 2 Peter to the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior through the apostles. Get back to it. Careful where you go for truth. And briefly, let me talk about us seeing our need for truth. Let's jot it down that way and then let me un untangle that a little bit in our passage here. Number two, you need to see your need for the truth. We have a desperate need for the truth. Now, if you're sick and you need a doctor, that's pretty uh, palpable, that's pretty evident, that's something very sentient. You feel it, it's right there, and you know it. I need help. It's interesting for all the people running to Christ to get their healing, 
In the bottom of verse 18, there's not only people getting their diseases healed, but it makes this statement. We've already encountered people that have this problem, but it says, there were those who were troubled with unclean spirits, and they were cured. Now, if you get a disease, usually that's just something that happens to you. You're a passive victim, if you will, of some disease. Right? My, my daughter is paralyzed from these down. You know, she, she didn't do anything to get that. But when it comes to being troubled by evil spirits, and we've only touched on this so far in, in Luke chapter 4, and we'll get into it more when we deal with later passages in Luke, but we see there's a kind of, of, of reciprocity and invitation, a kind of participation that usually leads to the troubling of evil, or in this case, unclean spirits. Now, that kind of takes this need to another level that may not be as obvious. In other words, if I know I got leprosy and I hear that Jesus the healer is there, I go and say, will you heal me? And he heals me. But if I got problems that I caused by my own immorality or my own doing, if I got a kind of spiritual harassment because of a spiritual failure in my life or some kind of participation in something that's wrong, now to think that he can figure, there's a, there's a kind of sensing a need that's not quite as, as elementary. And here are these people coming, saying, I, I need help. They knew they needed help because they knew that what they had was going to cause increasingly more difficult and com complex problems. In other words, there was a price to pay if we didn't fix this. I, I promised you I'd get to the conclusion, or at least I said we should look at it. Let's look at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, or the Sermon on the Plain. At the bottom of this chapter, Luke chapter 6, you see him wrap up this sermon the same way he wrapped up the Sermon on the Mount, whether it's the same sermon or not. It's irrelevant at this point. What we need to note is the conclusion is all about application. It's about us recognizing the need for incorporating this data. It says in verse number 47, everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I'll show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house. He dug, a deep, he dug deep. He laid a foundation on the rock. The floods rose. Some kind of testing of this work comes. The streams break out against the house, and it could not shake because it had been well built. Now go back to verse 47. This well-built analogy is based on people who hear that word and they do it. If you incorporate the sermon, you will have a life that is well-built, impervious to the kinds of destruction that will come if you disregard that destruction, you know, is, is going to topple the house, as he says in verse 49. You hear my words, you don't do them. You're like a man who builds his house without a foundation. The streams break, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. The need that we have for the data that's in the Sermon on the Plain is so much greater than you may recognize if you don't extrapolate the damage that will come to your life if you don't incorporate the sermon. You need this truth more than you need a healing. And let me even say this, this will wow you, even more than you need an immediate relief from the harassment of unclean spirits, if you will, that strange phenomenon that we're learning more about as we study through, through Luke. What do you mean? Even if... God could right now take all the damage from your marriage that has been caused by your participation in things that you should not do, and with a, with a moment, a touch, or a word can take it all away. My question is, what good would that do you a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now? Do you no good unless you incorporate the sermon that's to follow? I'll tell you this, to think about the inferiority of healing, if I could go through every hospital room in South Orange County, I'll start at chalk in orange and I'll work my way all the way down to the hospitals, all the way down here, and I, I heal everybody in every room. What good would that do them? Well, do them a lot of good right now. For some of them, it wouldn't do them any good five years from now. It would, would do none of them any good a hundred years from now. Unless, of course, the real problem, the bigger problem, is dealt with, and those problems are addressed in the sermon, not in the healing. It was provocative, perhaps, for me to say that even a spiritual release from, from the troubling of unclean spirits is also really of no value in the long run unless the sermon is incorporated. But I don't get that just from my, my, my supposition. I get it from Luke chapter 11. As long as we're, we're near it, let's go there real quick. It is an interesting passage. We'll, Lord willing, untangle a little bit more when we get to it, and we'll understand it on a deeper level. But let's start just by surveying. Christ's commentary on what exactly he's doing in Luke 6. People with troubled, un, who are troubled by unclean spirits were being quote-unquote cured. Here's another way to say it, verse 24, Luke 11:24. 24. 
Luke 11, 24, when the unclean spirit had gone out of a person, has gone out of a person, would you not say that's what we're talking about? We talk about being cured by the harassment of these unclean spirits? Great. It passes through, this is kind of a, a picturesque way to put it, waterless places seeking rest, but finding none. Now think that through. Stuff to do, places to go, problems to cause, can't find places to cause problems, can't find a place to latch on to, so to speak. So the Spirit says, I'll return to my house. Well, what did it leave? A person. So we're talking about a person's life here. From which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Of course, all the trouble caused by that troubling, unclean spirit now has been kind of tidied up. Knocked over this lamp, fixed that, patched that wall, painted that. Okay, things are back in order. Problem is, and the assumption, the inference here is, but there's nothing to take its place. There's no filling. There's no fixing. There's no real repair. It's just straightening up. Then it goes, and it brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. Let me put it this way. Every person Jesus healed, and every person with spiritual problems that was immediately and miraculously fixed are going to be in worse shape if they don't incorporate the truth that Jesus is about to preach. Do you see what I'm saying in this? The sermon is the most important thing. These truths are the most important thing. And even recognizing physical disease and spiritual maladies all speak to a deeper problem in our lives. The ultimate problem is standing before God on the day that you die. And of course, the sermon's going to address that. We'll get to that. But it addresses a lot more. It talks about issues of love and forgiveness. Think about that. If you don't incorporate the truth of biblical love and forgiveness, what kind of crash might come when the storms hit your life? Lose my marriage, lose my relationships, could wreck a church, all of it. If I don't incorporate this truth, justice, leadership, you name it. You can add the crash if you want to build a chart. Look at every topic that God brings up in this sermon and say, what happens if I don't incorporate it? Crash here, crash here, crash here, crash here. The ultimate crash, of course, is not being right with God on the day that you die, but there's a lot of lesser crashes. And part of the problem here in our lives is thinking that all we got to do is get our ticket to heaven. I really don't want the ethics of God to cramp my style. There's a lot of crashes that are going to come your way unless you see your need for the truth. Okay, well, let's hear the sermon. Let's hear the truth. Preach it, Mike. Well, the problem with it is if you just want to hear it, you will never have the advantage of the truth. And I almost goes without saying, and I almost feel like this is redundant, but number three in your outline, let's just recognize this. We need to be responsive to the truth. That shouldn't be any news for any of us, but we need to be responsive for the truth. Now again, building on the paradigm or the example of the people coming to Christ for healing in verse number 19, I take it a step further, just by way of analogy, that they came to him, they stood in his presence, they listened to him, but if they wanted their healing in verse number 19, Luke describes the fact that they needed to reach out and touch him. Now, that's not the case in every situation. Matter of fact, we see Jesus healing long distance in other texts, but here, these people had to reach out and touch him. And when they touched him, they got healed. I don't want to make too much of that parallel, but when it comes to our teaching, the teaching of Christ, I mean, really, it's more than just being in the presence of hearing it taught. It's about me reaching out and incorporating that truth into my life. It's about the James 1 thing, and we quote it all the time because it's such an important truth for people hearing the Word every week. And that is that God wants us to be doers of the Word and not hearers only who, do you know the rest of the verse? Deceive themselves. They delude themselves. Because sometimes if you think you have a lot of biblical knowledge, I know what Christ taught, we think that's it. It's not it. And you know that. Sometimes it's painfully uh, demonstrated, like in Dadeville, Alabama, a northeastern uh, little town, country suburb, not far from Montgomery, and these two people look it up in the paper, this was some time ago, but they got into an argument about who had more Bible knowledge. That caught my attention right there. Wow, a fight about Bible knowledge. And off they went, arguing and arguing, I know more, and I know that, can you name the judges, and how many you know, kings were there in the southern, off they went. I don't know what it was like, but they're arguing about it, and they got really red in the face about it, and it turned into a pushing and shoving match, and they're yelling at each other, and one guy goes to his house, gets a gun, comes back, and shoots the other guy dead. He wins, right? I mean, think about that. I mean, how that reads in the paper, ironic. Men fighting over Bible knowledge, right? Murders the other. It, 
wow. If you don't understand through something as blatant as that, that there's a big difference between having knowledge of the, of the truth and incorporating knowledge of the truth. I mean, that's what the Bible calls hypocrisy, and it's everywhere. Some people know a lot. It's like the guy that comes to the pastor, up, uh, to the pastor afterwards and says, yeah, I've been through the Bible a few times, and it's made no difference in my life. And the pithy pastor responds, well, it's not about you going through the Bible. Now it's about you having the Bible go through you. And the reality is a lot of people want to put their, their head to the work, when after they get their head to the work, they don't recognize what they got to do now is they need to put feet to their Bible study and do what it says. I quoted verse 47 in the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. Look at verse 46. Before he says, there's the difference between building on, the, on, on a foundation and one without a foundation. He says this, why in the world do you call me Lord, Lord, verse 46, and not do what I tell you? Stop thinking you're in with me and that you have some relationship with me as me being the Lord if you are not willing to do what I tell you. I mean, if I fix all your machines and show that I'm the ultimate authority on appliances and then I tell you how to run your appliance and you yawn your way through it, take a few notes and never do it, don't, don't, don't call me the king of appliances, right? I, I, I didn't influence you to take my instruction seriously. I know it's hard. Let me close with this passage, John 6. To be responsive to the truth is a commitment that we're going to make up front at the beginning of the series to say we're going to we're going to do it. We're going to respond to it. We're going to be doers of the word regardless of how it may grate against the cultural elite, my feelings, my intuition, my experience, whatever it might be, the polls. I want to do it because I know if this is really the Lord of life, the Holy One, I have no choice but to do what he says. This is the manufacturer giving me instructions about how to live life. John 6. Drop down to verse 60. Many of his disciples heard it. He had just been talking about the Father sent him. Verse 57, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he's going to live because of me. Oh, wow, you're making yourself out to be equal with the Father. You're making yourself out to be the source of life. You seem like you're taking the place of the Father in our lives. What's with all of that? This is a hard saying, they said. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, verse 61, John 6, 61 knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this. This is the big band of disciples. He said to them, do you take offense at this? Are you having trouble with this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man? Remember, I've trained you now to think of the Son of Man and think Daniel 7 immediately. I mean, that picture of the Messiah is the one who, as it's described in Daniel 7, possesses all authority, all dominion over all the nations, over all kingdoms of the world. What if you saw the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? A direct allusion to, to Daniel 7. What if you saw me going to the Father back in my glory? You're, you're complaining that I'm making myself out to be like God and that I'm going to be the source of life for you? What are you talking about? And how offended would you be if you saw me in my glory ascending to the throne? Verse 63. It's almost with frustration. He says, the spirit who gives life. Flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you, they're spirit and they're life. You've got to adopt them. You have to see them for what they are. And just in your own humanity and fallenness, you're not going to embrace it. You're not going to accept it. There are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus, parenthetically, John says, from the beginning, he knew those who, were, who, were, who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. He knew that always. Verse 65, he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. You need a supernatural work to be able to hear this and accept it. After this, verse 66, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. There will be many of you, if it's not in this sermon series, it'll be another one. That if we preach it uncompromisingly, clearly, plainly, and we expect us all as creations of the God of the universe to do what he says, you're going to go, I've had enough of this. I'm done. Go to a church or go someplace where I'm not going to hear all this. You may turn back and, and say, I can't take it. But he turns to his disciples, verse 67, and he says, do you want to go away as well? How about you guys? How about the 12? Simon Peter said, man, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We see that. And we've believed and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We've got no choice but to listen to you. You know what that takes when everybody else is going, I'm not going to listen to that anymore. It takes a real deal of humility, a lot of humility. 
We often quote the passage that I quoted for you in, in, uh, in James 1. We quote the verse, Be doers of the word and not hearers only who delude themselves. The verse in front of that says, Receive the word with meekness, humility, right, that was implanted in you. It takes real humility to recognize that if the king is the king and the holy one of God is the holy one of God, if he says it, that settles it. You're going to be mocked for it. A lot of the Sermon on the Plain is going to talk about that. You're going to have ridicule in your life from the poles, from the cultural elite, even going to grate against your own intuition and your experience. And even the scripture twisters are going to say, oh, you're all wrong. Why do you have to be so literal on all that stuff? Make a decision up front, a decision the apostles had to learn in the middle of this ministry of Christ. Where else are we going to go? We need this. <laughs> One old guy said, People reject the Bible not because it contradicts itself. People reject the Bible because it contradicts them. See? And you know, that I understand is a problem not just for the non-Christian, it's the problem for people seated in this room right now. The Word of God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cut. Think about Hebrews 4. Living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Anybody I know that likes surgery, right? Nobody. Oh, I haven't surgery Tuesday. They can't wait. Surgery's painful, right? It's, 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 it hurts. The recovery time's hard. You just stay in the hospital and eat the food. It's terrible. Surgery, nobody likes surgery. And yet there'll be thousands of them in, in Southern California this week. Why? If it's so unpleasant, why do people have surgery? Well, duh, Mike, because it's going to save their lives. They need it. That's why. Not only will there be a bunch of surgeries this week in Southern California, there will be people that die this week in Southern California that don't get the surgeries that if they had them would have saved their lives. Why? Some of them are just stubborn. You've met some, right? I'm not going in for surgery. I'm not going under the knife. I don't want that. But it can save your life. Here's the thing about the work of the Word of God. Active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, that's the rest of the verse, down to divide parts of our lives, separating even the motives of our own heart. I know that sometimes preaching is unpleasant. I know some of you hit me up, oh, why don't we preach more fun, friendly things, make us feel better. I'm just delivering the message. And when it comes to the message, sometimes it cuts. But the good in God's intention is to fix the problems in our lives. To come out the other side healthier, a life well built, that when the trials and troubles of this life come, it stands firm, impervious to disaster. God wants to do a good work in your life. He's going to do it through the preaching of his word. In this case, it couldn't be any more unadulterated in that we'll take the very words of Christ and re-preach those in the next 11 sessions. Let's be here with an open heart, ready for the word of God to do its work in our lives. Let's pray. Why don't you stand with me? I'll let you go and we'll pray together. God, we want you to do your good work in our lives, many of us at least. I hope I pray for most people in the room. Because we recognize, as the rest of that Hebrews 4 passage says, we're going to have to stand before you. You're the one with whom we have to give an account. Not to mention this is such a benefit for our lives. For us to live our lives in accordance with your word. Of course, God, what's most important is that we're ready for that last day. when we'll step into your presence across the threshold of this life. But as 2 Peter 1 says, we've got to add to our faith all these supplemental virtues which come from understanding the teaching of godliness. It's good for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. God, we want to get trained through this sermon on the plane. We want to know all that we can know about every topic that, that your son brings up in this great sermon. Prepare our hearts for it. There'll be things that may be uncomfortable because it brings conviction in areas that are close to our hearts. It'll change things that we don't want to change going to call for adjustments like the mirror of James 1 holding up that reflection of the problem that needs to be fixed and we're going to not want reform in that area. We don't want God to touch that part of our lives, but God, we should know better and like the apostles had to respond there in John 6, help us to say, this is the information we need. Where else are we going to go? You are the Lord, the Holy One, manufacturer of our lives. We were made by you and for you. Help us, please to be resolved, resolved ahead of time to obey your word. So prepare us for this, God. Thanks for this great opportunity to study this great sermon by your son.
May it change our lives and bring glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen.